Luke chapter 16 and verse 19. I will endeavor to be very brief today because I believe that God wants to fill somebody with the baptism of the Holy Ghost in this place. Today. Is there anybody that agrees with that? I bind that spirit of doubt. I bind that spirit of human reasoning that would say, well, I've prayed before, or I I don't know if I can get the Holy Ghost, or I don't know if I could get back to that place where I can be renewed in the Holy Ghost. Uh, It's a lie from hell. Your heavenly Father loves you, and he wants to give good gifts to you. Mm. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. I don't exactly know what fared sumptuously means. But I can imagine it's probably about like having a pan of Aquila's cinnamon rolls at your disposal every single day. Maybe having one of those two-pound tomahawk ribeyes Henry whips up, brings over some scraps, but the whole ribeye. Like a plate of Brittany Miller's chocolate chip cookies. My Lord, we are a blessed church. You better bring some money to that auction because I'm going after them cinnamon rolls and them chocolate chip cookies. You guys do not want to watch me leave with all of the goodies, but I'll do it. I'll do it. Amen. Please don't make me do it. I don't want to buy a new wardrobe. But he fared sumptuously, which leveraged at his gate full of sores. Right now, all of us know exactly which one we want to be. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Just, just, just a crumb. Just let me scrape the bottom Of the pan. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And I preach in your hearing for the next few moments today how could a man die better? Let's pray one more time in this place. Lord, I thank you for your presence we feel already. I'm confident, Lord, in what you want to do in this place. It is not going to be me or my ability. It is going to be your spirit. Uh, I will not rely on oratory. I will not rely on my intellect. Uh, But, Lord, let your spirit flow from this place. Uh, Let the ground of every heart be prepared to receive the word. Uh, I bind, God, distraction. Uh, I bind discouragement. Uh, I bind disobedience, Lord. Uh, I will embrace. I will accept. I will obey that word as it goes forth today in Jesus name Amen. go ahead and slap your neighbor and then you may be seated I was reading a book by an author named Rick Atkinson this week it was a rare occasion not that I was reading a book uh, but It is rare that by Monday or Tuesday, God begins to speak to me for the next Sunday. But as I was reading through this book, there was a a line that leapt off the page. April 12th, 1945, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was settling in for an unprecedented fourth term as the President of the United States. In an era of larger-than-life figures, FDR, as he is now known, was a giant. Born into a wealthy family, he was educated in the finest schools that America could offer. It was FDR that would be elected in a time of great tribulation and trial in the country and indeed even in the world. We know it now as the Great Depression. For better or for worse, this is not a political sermon, he radically transformed American politics and society. In fact, every time you get paid, you can still thank FDR for this little thing called Social Security. FDR would steer America's course 
through World War II, the most destructive event in human history. He was instrumental in holding together a coalition of very different nations. Britain was an empire whose fortunes were, fortunes were waning. And after the war, the USSR and the United States would emerge as the world superpowers. FDR would push for the founding of the United Nations. It was a Thursday, and the president, desperate for rest, had traveled to Georgia. And there he would rest while posing for a portrait. As his lunch was prepared, the president would say aloud, My head, my head, complaining of a tremendous headache. He would grasp his forehead and fall victim to a cerebral hemorrhage. His blood pressure would rapidly spike, being read at one point as 300 over 190. Two hours later, he would be pronounced dead. It was recorded that Winston Churchill would sob like a child when he learned of the president's passing, declaring his life must therefore be regarded as one of the most commanding events in human destiny. The next day, the papers would publish, publish the news of his death to a shocked nation. But it was the line from Roosevelt's chief of staff that caught my attention. He simply asked, how could any man die better. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 22, we've read already of a rich man living sumptuously and a certain poor man named Lazarus who lives under horrific circumstances. Verse 22 continues the narrative and we read that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's it is no surprise to us that Lazarus dies. After all, his body is covered in sores. Certainly, dogs licking your sores cannot be hygienic. It certainly must be a source of infection. You couple that with the malnourishment and the exposure to the elements. It's, it's no surprise to anybody in the room today that the beggar dies. He's carried by angels into the bosom of Abraham. But the Bible says the rich man also died and was buried. The name Lazarus means God helps. It had to seem ironic to those who had actually taken the time to learn the name of this beggar. He's pitifully poor. He's covered in sores. Dogs surrounding him at all times. Lazarus, he who is helped by God, uh, seemingly unable to shoo away the dogs. The nameless rich man. He had a funeral. Mourners would weep. He would be embalmed carefully and laid in a tomb. But his funeral would be his last moment of comfort. The Bible makes no mention of what happens to the body of Lazarus. But the Bible does tell us that angels carried him to the, the bosom of Abraham. In verse 23, we begin to read of the rich man again. In hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham... Have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. Even now, the one that he ignored in this life, he desires to serve him in his death. But Abraham replies, son... Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all of this, between you and us, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, that they would come from thence. And so he says, I pray, Father, 
that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also should come to this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham replies and says, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. A challenging story, certainly, from the lips of Jesus Christ. I do not call it a parable. I believe it is an actual story. It's a very rare occasion that Jesus uses a name. It is no accident that it is in the same conversation and it follows closely on the heels of Luke 16 and 13. No servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The implication of the story is that the nameless rich man served mammon as his God, and in this life, his God was good to him. But his God had no power over the next life. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, the Bible says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment James would write in James chapter 4 and verse, verse 14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanishes away. We're familiar with going outside on those cold late March mornings where you just breathe out and your breath forms a vapor. You cannot grasp it. You cannot hold it. You cannot keep it because as quickly as it appears, it fades, it vanishes away. Jesus is challenging a human attitude. Earthly wealth does not guarantee eternal life. Now I caution that it was not their wealth or their lack thereof that decided their placement. It was their attitude toward God. Because you can be poor and be wicked at the same time. It could have been a very different story if Lazarus was laying at the gate cussing out the rich man every single day. You can also, on the other side of the same coin, be rich and be righteous at the same time. With God, all things are possible. But you cannot serve two masters. You bring no shame on the kingdom of God because you live financially poor. God is not embarrassed of you when you've hardly got two nickels to rub together. You don't have to hang your head and walk into the house of God as if somehow your poor financial state lowers you in relative value and worth. You are a human being made in the image of God, and to Him you are precious. On the other side of the coin, you bring no glory to the kingdom of God simply because you're financially wealthy. Your bank account does not itself glorify God. But if you want to bring glory to the name of Jesus, then no matter how much you earn every week, every month, or every year, you work diligently, you steward carefully, you give cheerfully and generously, and you thank God freely for whatever state you find yourself in. Why? Because all comes from God, and all, whether it be good or whether it be poor, it does not matter, because in whatever state you find yourself, the greatest place you can end up is in a place of contentment. The five-talent individual heard, well done. And we all say, well, of course, he had five talents. The two-talent individual heard, well done. Well done. 
The one talent individual would have heard, well done, as well. But instead, he allowed insecurity. He allowed fear to speak to his mind. And instead of obeying God and giving cheerfully and sacrificially, instead of surrendering, he demonstrated he had a greater faith uh, in the ability of an earth to keep something than God to keep it. Paul would write, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound, and I know how, whatever state I'm in, to be content. God will keep some in a state of being abased because you've never learned to be content in whatever state you find yourself. I want to contrast a story with the story of FDR. He was born in 1933. I could say his name, but few of you would know it. Not a wealthy family. Few belongings. Little in the way of quality education. In fact, some pretty hilarious stories about his elementary years. It was the responsibility of the first grade class to wake up the hungover teacher if the superintendent started driving down the gravel road. That doesn't exactly scream high SAT scores. He would lie about his age to join the army. And combat in Korea would create scars on his body and on his mind. Returned home, married. Began to raise a family. His family would be greatly troubled at times. He would work as a cook, as a policeman as a farmer, as a trucker, and rarely, rarely would there ever be a surplus in the bank. During this time, perhaps related to the scars of a war, halfway across the world, he would battle with addiction. In 1977, he would give his life over to Jesus Christ. A marriage would be restored and chains of addiction would be broken. He would live his life, even serving the Lord, with very little in the way of retirement savings. He would work well into his 70s simply to make ends meet. A grown man, 75 years old, driving the preschool bus. In 2020, he would pass away in a nursing home, victim to COVID. There were no front page articles there were no cannonade salutes. He was loved by those that survived him, yes, but little was written about him, and in a few generations, his memory will fade. All of his earthly belongings are now in a storage unit in Watertown, South Dakota. How could a man die any better? I'll tell you. He may not have had any prized earthly possessions, a large trust fund, or a massive estate. His legacy, while I'm thankful for it, is known only to his immediate family. It is doubtful many volumes will be written about this man. I've got many photos and videos of baptisms here at the Jesus Church on my phone, and I celebrate every single one. On days where it, it seems like I'm down and I'm going through a battle, there's just something about flipping through a photo roll uh, and saying, no, devil, you're a liar. Uh, they've been baptized in Jesus' name. Uh, I'll watch videos of people. I got a video of Janelle receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I hope I don't embarrass her, but I've gone back to it a time or two uh, to remind myself uh, the devil is a liar. There are young people all across this state that are desperate uh, for a real relationship with Jesus Christ. But I've got one that's extra precious to me. Because one February day, my precious grandfather went down in the waters of baptism in Jesus' name and would come out of the water speaking in a heavenly language. It would just be months, perhaps a year after that, that dementia would begin to take his mind from him. He would head off, victim to COVID in 2020, his mind most of the way gone, living in a very small room with his wife. But I ask you, how could a man... 
die better, uh, destitute and penniless, uh, known only to his immediate family, uh, but a life uh, that obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I submit to you today, uh, there is no better way uh, for somebody to die. Uh, it does not matter uh, if in this earth you had wealth. Uh, it does not matter uh, if in this earth you were broke uh, and penniless uh, and alone. Uh, if at the end of it all, uh, you've been baptized in the name of Jesus uh, and been filled with his spirit, uh, there is no better way. I want to challenge somebody right now. Uh, stop allowing the devil uh, to beat you up uh, and make that you make you think you're small fry uh, or that you're not important uh, because your car has a little rust uh, or it's got an extra zero uh, in the miles. Uh, it's a lie from hell. Uh, if you've been filled with his spirit, uh, you uh, are wealthy. Uh, you uh, are blessed. Uh, if you're connected uh, to the body of Christ, uh, there is no better way to go How could a man die any better? Some of us in this church uh, are blessed by God uh, with finances. Uh, and I rejoice with you. Uh, I am not jealous of you. Uh, but you better understand uh, your life is a vapor. Uh, that is something that you have to overcome. Uh, it's not something that makes it easier to serve the kingdom, uh, to have excess money in the bank. Uh, it's far too easy to begin to rely on the arm of finance. Uh, and some of us, uh, we're not going going to have retirement savings. Uh, we're going to work until our body breaks down uh, and we can't work anymore. Uh, but it does not matter uh, how it ends on this earth uh, because eventually uh, if we have a funeral at all, uh, most of us are going to be carried in a pine box, uh, lowered in a hole uh, and a few generations down uh, there will be no pictures uh, or remembrance of us. Uh, but when you die uh, with the name of Jesus called over you uh, the angels will come uh, and carry you to a place of comfort in Abraham's bosom. The rich man, now in torment, realizes that his own needs are not going to be met and begins to think of his five brothers. Obviously, if he could go back in time, he would change places in a heartbeat with the poor man that laid at his gate. He would switch the story if he could. There's no mention of him thinking of these brothers when alive. It's the danger of earthly possessions that distracts us from what really matters. Comfortable or miserable, this life is just a vapor. Send Lazarus to them. And the reply comes back from Father Abraham. They have the law and the prophets. The rich man knew that his brothers were too distracted by the affairs of this life to pay attention to something as basic as the law and the prophets. The dead do not preach the gospel, but the living can. We are surrounded by rich men, by men like Lazarus, and by everything in between. And I'll admit freely and fully to you today, it is often easier to share the gospel to Lazarus than it is to the rich man. But that's a spirit of self-protecting pride. And we need to drag that down in our life and nail it to a cross. Because uh, as Jesus would say in John 3 and 5, uh, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, there are others that have gone before that if they could go back and do it again, they'd change some things in their lives. But you and I have heard the law and the prophets. We've heard the scriptures. We've heard what God says awaits those who like the rich man refuse to serve him as their God. Lazarus can never go back from the grave, but 
watch you and I uh, have to run out into our city uh, between life uh, and death uh, holding the true word of God uh, and declare to the rich uh, and the comfortable uh, to the poor uh, and the broken uh, and to everyone in between uh, there's only one good way to die Romans 10 tells us, for the scripture saith, whoso believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There is no difference between the Jew or the Greek. The Lord, uh, the same Lord is rich over all unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace uh, and bring the glad tidings of good things. Uh, rich or poor, uh, mansion or hut, uh, whatever state they find themselves in, uh, someone has to tell them. You cannot be intimidated when their car is newer. You cannot be intimidated when their house is bigger. You cannot be intimidated when their clothes are nicer. You cannot be intimidated when their last name carries more clout than you or they've got a bigger following than you. Inside of you, you possess the greatest treasure that's ever been given to a man. And somebody's got to tell them. Somebody's got to tell the rich man. Somebody's Somebody's got to look the banker in the eye uh, and tell him, except you be baptized uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, somebody's got to dress the wounds uh, of a Lazarus laying by a gate uh, and love on him uh, and provide for him. Uh, but after all of that, you still got to tell them. I want to skip, I want to skip the rest of what I've got going on here. Why don't we stand together in this place? Let's lift our hands together in this house right now. Why don't we talk to the Lord in this place? Uh, I believe that God wants to impart a spirit of boldness to his church. There's been a lot of teaching. There's been a lot of preaching over the last month about the 11th hour. And we're walking into it. I believe that God wants to connect somebody in this church to a wealthy individual that cries themselves to sleep at night uh, and is taking medication because they can't break free of that bondage of suicide. Somebody in this church... Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 says this. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You'll notice the car, the bank account, the 401k, their social status was nowhere in this. But it says they love not their lives unto the death. Why are we so quick to protect our lives? I ask for myself as well as for you. Hebrews chapter 11 tells tale of those that would be sawn asunder. Those that would be killed with the sword, beaten, stoned, left for dead, destitute, living in cages. History tells us that some Christians had the distinct privilege of being turned into Nero's torches. Jesus called us the light of this world. 
And perhaps Nero thought he would mock that a little bit. After the great fire in Rome in 64 AD, he would round up as many Christians as possible, and many of them were sent into the Colosseum to face lions and gladiators for which they were completely unprepared. Still others would be daubed in pitch or resin and fastened up on a pole next to the street. And they would burn from the feet up in a slow, agonizing death as Nero and other prominent Romans would drive their chariots down this street lit by the light of Nero's torches. But I tell you, how could a man die better than with a life that has been lived and a life that has been given to the gospel of Jesus Christ? And they loved not their lives to the death. But God help us. If we're too afraid of what this person or that person might say, might think, or how they'll react. I'm going to open this altar in just a moment. I know it's a little bit different. I know maybe it's not flowing quite like maybe sometimes it does. But I believe that God wants to impart to us a spirit of boldness and a spirit of urgency into our heart in this hour. There are those that have been hearing the chirp of the enemy as he tells you, you're insignificant, your car's a piece of junk, your home is small. There have been those that have not been hearing the voice of God saying, give, sacrifice, your house is too big, your car's too fancy. But God wants all of that to change today. There's no better way to leave this world than with a life lived in obedience to the gospel. So here's what I want to do. If you know that you need a baptism of boldness and a baptism of urgency in your life, because you know this life is a vapor, and I've got to tell as many people as possible, I want you to come to this altar this morning. Or a spirit of pride based on your standing or your bank account, I want you to come to this altar this morning. We've got to get a revelation of the urgency of the hour. We've got to stop being so worried about our comfort, our finances, our retirement, and remember that there is a lost, dying, and hurting world that surrounds us.